Okay, before we move ahead to the next pattern, I'll ask, answer a few questions. This question is, uh, where the CE object, CEO object is created in the company class? Right, so it is not created. I did not uh, give the entire implementation, right? We need to first actually create a CEO class that implements the employee. And in our case, CEO would be a composite object, a composite class which will be able to uh, include atomic objects inside it. And then you will be uh, able to create object of the CEO class in the company class. Right, so CE object implementation I have not shown. Right, I think you missed the part where I told that I am just creating a part of that tree. A very small portion of the tree is what we created here, the left hand side, where there was a general manager who had a manager and clerk inside him, and then the manager further had two clerks. Right, okay, uh, there was one more question. If we add a new interface in the manager class, like show manager details, then it will not be called as a composite pattern. So you're right on that because then we will not be able to access uh, the uh, all the atomic as well as the composite objects using the same interface, right? Uh, can you also please show us the pseudo code for this example? Okay, so you want me to show how one would write the pseudo code in case you are uh, not familiar with Java, right? So I can do that. So uh, instead of adding it right here, what I'll do is that I'll add additional slides where the pseudo code would be written, right? And you could make out is uh, you would be able to understand that how you would proceed by uh, by. Uh, proceed in case you had to write the pseudocode, right? In exam, do we need to write pseudocode for all the classes? So that would be mentioned. I mentioned earlier also, there would be, it is highly unlikely that you are asked to write the code. But in case you are asked to write the code, uh, you would be expected to write pseudocode. But if you are familiar with Java, please go ahead and write the code in Java, right? Because it's either uh, the expected is either pseudocode or code written in Java, right? <clears throat> can we write code in C++ also? Uh, you can write it, right? But uh, implement with, uh, add a lot of comments with it so that the the evaluator is able to understand what you are trying to do. Which other book we need to purchase for the comprehensive examination? So there are two textbooks that are there. T1 is your uh, by Craig Larman, which is mostly focused towards UML modeling and it does cover the design patterns as well. Or T2 is totally on design patterns. So these two books uh, are the ones that you need. In case you want to go for more books, that is your choice. So there are people who come with only two books and there are people who come with bags of books. So it's up to you, right? Okay, let's move ahead to the next pattern. So we have a lot of patterns still to cover, right? So uh, the next is your behavioral design pattern. So <laughs> we'll take up uh, two patterns today from this behavioral design pattern category. What does behavioral design patterns do? They help us identify common communication patterns between objects and realize these with the help of patterns, right? So these behavioral design patterns ideally help to uh, solve issues related with communication between objects, right? These patterns help to increase flexibility in communication between the objects. And some of the examples of behavioral design patterns are iterator, strategy, observer, command, interpreter, 
uh, visitor template, etc. So today we are going to take up first the traitor pattern, and then the next would be the observer pattern. So let's start with the traitor pattern right away. So this is a traitor pattern. exposing their underlying structure, right? What is an aggregate object? An aggregate object is an object that contains other objects for the purpose of grouping those objects in a unit, right? What is an aggregate object? An array, for example, is an aggregate object, a list, for, an, for example, is an aggregate object. A hash table is an aggregate object, right? A collection is an aggregate object, right? So an object that aggregates within itself objects of same kind, right, is called an aggregated object. And what I, iterator pattern does, the iterator pattern aims to provide a way to access aggregate objects sequentially, right? So it's important that it provides a way to access these objects sequentially without exposing their underlying structure, right? It allows for different kind of traversal methods <coughs> used to avoid breaking encapsulation by requiring data access to iterator only, right? So the key idea that this iterator pattern aims to implement is that the traversal of an aggregate object is moved outside the aggregate object and is moved into the iterator object. This helps prevent uh, the concept of encapsulation, right? So my aggregate object, which uh, aggregates various objects, which is a data structure kind of an object, which includes within itself the other objects, should not be troubled to provide traversal processes as well, right? The aggregate object is only responsible for aggregating and storing those objects within itself. The traversal part of the of uh, uh, traversing through that aggregate object need to be implemented by another object. And this another object is the traitor object, which takes care of the traversal part so that it increases the cohesion of the aggregate object. It does only storage of the aggregate object and does not take care of the uh, iterator part, iterating part, right? The iteration or the traversal part of that aggregate object is done by a separate object. I hope it's clear. It will be more clear as we go through uh, the implementation. <coughs> Right, so this is the kind of the structure an iterator pattern has. So there is an aggregate interface, right? The important method to note in the aggregate interface is the create iterator. Okay, so this aggregate interface implements a method, provides a method which has to be implemented by every concrete aggregator. A concrete aggregator is the class which implements the aggregate interface, right? And then it should provide implementation for the method create iterator, which returns an object of type iterator, right? What is iterator? Iterator is another interface, right, which provides traversal methods, right? These, what are these methods? Say, for example, has next and next, right? So the has next, is a method which helps you to find out whether there are more objects in that aggregate and next is returns you the next object, right? 
So ideally, <coughs> this would be the implementation of the iterators uh, of the of these two methods that are there in this interface. But this in implementation is provided by the concrete iterator, which actually implements the iterator interface, which is has next uh, has next method and next method. Next method returns the object, right? So these are the four participants that are there in this iterator pattern. So here's a description of these participants. So there's an iterator, which is the interface for accessing and traversing the elements. You have a concrete iterator, which implements the iterator interface and helps you to keep track of the current position in the traversal, right? Further, there is an aggregate interface, which defines an interface for creating the iterator object, right? It defines an interface for creating an inter iterator object, right? So this we saw just now that my aggregate interface defines a method for creating the iterator object, right? And finally, I have a concrete aggregate which implements the aggregate interface and returns an instance of the concrete iterator, right? So this is what, it, uh, which are, these are the four major participants in the iterator pattern. Let's have a look at one of the example and then we'll see the implementation of this uh, particular example using the iterator pattern. <clears throat> okay, so I have a aggregate interface, right? So my abstract list in this case is an aggregate, right? The concrete aggregates are two. There are two concrete aggregates, list and skip list. Each of these lists as well as skip list, they implement the abstract list aggregate interface, right? If you see here, my abstract list aggregate interface has the most important method, which is create iterator, right? Additionally, it has more methods, count, append, and remove, right? Each of this concrete aggregator, which implement the abstract list, provide uh, implementation for all the methods which are listed by the aggregate. Coming to the iterator interface, the iterator interface has four methods. First, next, is done, and the current type, right? Now there are two iterators, concrete iterators, which are implemented list iterator and skip list iterator, right? So when I will invoke, when I need to traverse a list object, I need a list iterator. And when I need to traverse a skip list, I need a skip list iterator, right? Let's see the implementation of the same and then we'll be able to understand it in a much better manner. <coughs> So you create a list object, right? You create a skip list object. Each of them is a list, right? Each, each of them is a concrete aggregator and it implements the aggregate interface, right? Then you may assume that objects are added into this list as well as skip list, right? Next, I want to iterate it. How will I iterate it? I will obtain an iterator, right? So for list iterator, I will invoke, I say list dot create iterator, right? This will return an object of list iterator, which actually implements iterator, right? This is what we saw just now. <coughs> Okay, similarly, when I need to traverse the skip list, I need a skip list iterator, right? So again, I will invoke a skip list dot create iterator. 
this will return me an object of skip list iterator which implements iterator right i have not given the implementation of that but it is obvious that it creates a new object of skip list iterator and returns that right then using these iterators i will now traverse the list okay so these iterators provide me with methods like iterator dot first if iterator dot is done right so there are more objects in it this returns the first object it, this one returns a boolean which tells me uh, whether it is <clears throat> whether there are more objects in the list or not and this one actually returns the correct current item and this takes the pointer to the next item right so this using this list iterator you are able to traverse the list using the skip list iterator you will be able to traverse the skip list right so the skip list iterator right what is the difference between these two iterators right let me just explain that so suppose my list iterator uh, <coughs> aims to traverse the list sequentially one by one and skip list iterator is supposed to traverse the list by skipping one element right so you uh, iterate to 1 3 5 7 so on right so in the skip list iterator the implementation would be such that whenever you would say iterator dot next it will not it will return elements by skipping the elements right so it will return 1 then it will return 3 then 5 then 7 right so that means you are able to traverse that list based on a particular kind of traversal method which is being governed by its corresponding iterator right because the skip list iterator is designed in that manner it will you will be able to access the elements of the skip list the way you want right this is you are trying to move the traversal aspect of the uh, that particular aggregate object into a different iterator object so that you are able to iterate through it traverse that object the way you desire okay a very good example of the iterator pattern already exists in java right so your java provides build in support for the iterator pattern using the enumeration interface right so all those who are familiar with using java would be able to understand this in a much better manner so when you have to iterate through a vector or a hash table right so that that was supported in jdk 1 uh, 1.1 where there were only the vector vector and hash table which were the two aggregate classes right so when you have to iterate through these two aggregate classes you obtain an enumeration out of it right so that enumeration is what you use to iterate over that aggregate object and the enumeration has i think two method has next uh, has next and next right so has next tells you whether there are more elements in that particular aggregate uh, and next returns you the next object right and moreover in jdk 1.2 a new collection package has been in, uh, introduced with addition of more aggregate classes which includes sets lists maps and all of them can be Uh, iterated using the iterator interface right i hope this is clear the iterator pattern you can go through the implementation small implementation example that i have given here and just try and implement this the missing parts right so if you will implement the missing parts you will able to be you will be able to understand actually what it is what is happening right so the this particular method 
create iterator list or create iterator it creates an object of the list iterator right and that list iterator has to implement all the uh, methods which are there in the iterator interface which is get next is more first next is done right similarly my skip list iterator is supposed to implement that particular those methods the way a skip list has to be implement uh, uh, traversed by skipping one object after another right and once you are able to implement all these uh, iterators then you can use them to traverse the lists i think that's it for the iterator pattern i'll take up a few questions and then we'll move to the last pattern for the day which is the observer pattern <clears throat> okay the question is sudo code should also be of java code uh, again i repeat preferably yes but in case you're not familiar with java sudo code is what is expected to be written in english right so you can say invoke creator uh, create iterator method on list object it returns the iterator right so you can use english language right so you can refer to any kind of a, any data structure kind of a book where you would definitely find a lot of sudo codes that are written right so sudo codes do not specifically use the syntax that is that are there to a particular language but they are written more in english right i think that's a very difficult question for uh, thing to do it says that if possible please provide the sudo code for all these patterns for people who don't know java right so that's very really difficult for me to do i would like people to opt to do this so if you can just uh convert at least few of them into sudo code and mail them to me i will put them on the portal right and then we can do it <clears throat> okay the question uh, it's coming for the second time how we can access skipped elements in a skipped list implementation right so that is that uh there would be Uh, elements which you intentionally want to skip you don't do not want to access the elements that you have already skipped right so the implementation is that kind that you want to only access the uh, say the odd number elements or the even number elements so you did need not bother that you have missed out some elements right it is it is the requirement is such that you want only the uh, either the even number elements or the odd number elements okay so in comprehensive exam perspective is it required to go through other patterns which are not covered in the contact session so uh, you please keep your uh, course handout as the reference point for the um design patterns along with the recorded content so the recorded content is in line with the course handout so that would form the uh, syllabus for your comprehensive examination so what is whatever is covered there is what is your part of the course i think i've covered most of the question the majority of the questions uh, uh, move around the concept that uh, how we would be able to write sudo code for these so i will try and put in uh, a few of the sudo codes as far as possible so that you understand how you would have to write a sudo code okay there is there is a request to take up a case study and then explain how um the uh, various patterns can be applied to that particular case study so that is there in my mind i will 
try and arrange a tutorial session for the same to take up a case study and see how the and explain how the uh, various design patterns can be uh, put into that case study, right? Okay, let us move ahead and uh, let's move to the last design pattern for the day, which is the observer pattern. Now, the observer pattern is also a behavioral pattern. It defines a one to many dependency between objects so that when one object changes state, all its dependents are notified and updated automatically. Right? So it's a one to many dependency. There is one subject which is called observable, right? And it is also called a subject. And there are many observers who attach themselves to the subject. The subject has a concept which is called state. Whenever the state of the subject changes, all the objects need to be notified, right? This is the whole idea behind the observer pattern. There is a one-to-many dependency relationship. One is the main, which is the subject or the observable. The others are observers. The observers attach themselves to the subject or observable. The subject has something called as a state. Whenever the state of the observer changes, the observables, the observers which are attached to the subject have to be notified so that they can be updated automatically. Right? <clears throat> so it encapsulates the engine component, which is the sub subject at abstraction. So my subject is actually the engine. And there are variable components in the observer hierarchy. Right? So uh, let's see what are the participants and how the work flows. So it defines an object which is called the keeper of the data model or the business logic. And this main object is the subject or the observable. Right? So my subject or observable Observable is something you observe, right? This is the main engine, as well as it is defined as the keeper of the data model, right? Usually, uh, it is defined in this way that the data model is stored with the subject. Whenever the data model change, a notification is sent to the observers, which are actually views. Right? They, the observers actually provide the user interface or views for display of the data model. Right? So as soon as the data model changes, the view part is also supposed to change. Right? So my observable or the subject is the keeper of the data model. It delegates all the view functionality to the decoupled and distinct observer objects, right? An observer object does not know what, which are the other observers which are attached to the subject, right? But the subject is aware as to which are all the observers that are attached to me. The observers register themselves with the subject as they are created. Whenever the subject changes, it broadcasts, <coughs> sorry, it broadcasts to all the registered observers that it has changed. And each observer queries the subject for that state change and displays the changed state 
accordingly. Right? Also, very correctly, it is also called the publisher subscriber model. Am I right? So there is a publisher and various subscribers attach themselves to the publisher, right? The publisher publishes its states and the subscriber get to know that there is a change in the state, right? I'll explain the observer pattern again. So there is a subject which is the keeper of the data model. It is also called observable. It consists of the data model. There are a large number of observers who attach themselves to the subject or observable. Whenever the state of the subject changes, it notifies the observers about a state change. Each observer queries the subject for the change in the state and displays the changed state accordingly. Right? You will understand it in a much better manner as we move ahead. So this is the structure of the observer pattern. So there is a subject, right, which is an interface. It has three methods, attach, observer, detach, and observer, and notify, right? So all these three methods are important. Any concrete subject that is there must implement these uh, methods which are there in the subject interface, right? <clears throat> then there is an observer interface. The observer interface has an update method. Okay, the update method, uh, the concrete observer implements the observer interface and provides implementation for the update method, right? So ideally, there are four participants, the subject, the concrete subject, which implements the subject interface, the observer interface, and the concrete observer interface, uh, sorry, the concrete observer class, which implements the observer interface. Right? Let's see an implementation of the same. Okay, there's one question. Are keeper and view the other names for the observable and the observer respectively? Yes, you can take it, but ideally it is not a standard name. Okay, but it is like one maintains the model, the observable or the subject maintains the model, and the observers are usually used to display the uh, changed state. So that is why they say the view is there. Okay. <clears throat> These are classes. Why are you calling it as an interface? Uh, I'll explain again. Subject and observer are interfaces. They are not classes. Concrete subject and concrete observer are classes. Concrete subject implements the subject interface. Concrete observer implements the observer interface. Right? I think this clarifies, clarifies which participants are classes and which participants are uh, interfaces. Right? Okay. Let's move ahead. So these are my participants. The topmost is my subject, which is also known as the observable. An observable is an object which notifies the observers about the change in it state, right? Any number of observer objects may observe a subject or observable. It is an interface. It also provides an interface for attaching and detaching observer objects, right? So this is what we saw. My observable or subject must have an attach and a detach method. Additionally, it must have a notify method, okay? The next participant is the observer, which is also an interface. It defines an updating interface for objects 
that should be notified of changes in a subject. So this has an update method, right? Then my concrete subject implements the subject interface. It stores a state of interest of concrete observers, right? So whatever is the state which the observers are monitoring, this is stored in my concrete subject. Additionally, uh, send a notification to its observer when its state changes. So it has a implementation for the other methods that are there, right? So this is my concrete subject. It has a state and additionally, it will have set state and get state methods. The state is the subject state and it will also provide implementation for the attach, detach, and the notify methods, right? The last participant in the uh, in this pattern is the concrete observer. It maintains a reference to the concrete subject object, right? My concrete observer needs to maintain a reference to the concrete subject object. This is very important, otherwise it will not be able to uh, get the state from the concrete subject. Right, so it need to maintain a reference of the concrete subject, store state that should stay consistent within the subject state. So it even maintains a reference to the uh, a, a reference where it stores the current state of the subject so that um, it again queries the subject for the state and then displays that state. It implements the observer. Uh, update interface to keep its state consistent with the subject state, right? So this is what we saw. The concrete observer uh, implements the update uh, interface, which is provided by the observer, right? <clears throat> so these are the four important participants in the observer pattern. Let's move to the implementation. Very happily, uh, the observer pattern implementation is uh, there is provided by the inbuilt uh, classes in Java. So Java provides observer, observable, and observer classes as inbuilt support for the observer pattern. Right. So this is there in the util package. So there is java.util.observable class, which is the base subject class. Right. This is the subject class. One can implement this particular uh, uh, interface and provide, so it's an interface, so one can implement this particular interface and provide implementation for rest of the methods. Additionally, there is java.util.observer interface, which can also be implemented. So I just give you an, show you an implementation of the same in Java before that. So the observable has various methods. So it has the method add observer so that is required. It has a delete observer, right? So add and delete observers are required in the subject so that you can add a observer as well as delete observer. Then set changed indicates that if the state of the object has changed and clear changed, this method is used to indicate that this object has no longer changed, right? So once it has notified all the observers, it uh, changes its state to a clear changed um, level so that no more the, uh, so that there is not, a, there does not ha happen that there is a repeat notification that is being sent to the observers, right? So once all the observers have been notified of the recent change, you clear the change so that there is no repeat notification that is sent to the observers. Then uh, there are methods has changed, notify observers, notify observers without, uh, without an argument so that it iterates over all the existing observers and notify them, right? So the, you can go through this uh, documentation. Then there is uh, the observer has the update method, right? I'll just quickly show you the implementation. 
So there is a, a concrete subject, okay, which extends the observable. So this is in this case they have made it uh, in Java they have made it as a class, not an interface. But ideally it should be an interface. Otherwise you'll not be able to abstract uh, implement. Uh, uh, you will not be able to extend more classes, right? Uh, but it is the way that they have done it. So it extends the observable inter uh, class, which is an abstract, which is a uh, which is a class, observable class, uh, which uh, which is in parallel to the subject interface. Let's see what is this particular concrete subject doing. It has two data model objects, right? It has a name and it has a price, right? So the idea is it maintains a state in terms of name and price, right? Whenever there is a change in the name or the price, which is a data model of this particular class, which is the state of this particular class, the observers which attach themselves to this concrete object should be notified, right? That's the whole idea, right? So uh, this is the constructor of the concrete subject. Okay, it takes a name and price. And then these are the two getter methods for name and price. Okay, let's move ahead. So there is a setter method. Set name and set price. Now these two methods are important. Whenever set name or set price are invoked, that means there is a change in the state of the subject, right? The state of the subject is defined in this case in terms of two attributes that it has, name and price, right? Whenever there is a change in the name or price of the subject, the observers are to be notified. Now the name and price, which are private attributes of this concrete subject, in order to change them, one needs to invoke the set name or the set price method. That means whenever these two methods are invoked, the state of the concrete subject is changed. Right? That means this is the place where you need to invoke the notify observers method right and that you can see here that the name attribute is changed to the is set to the incoming name value then a set changed method is invoked right which which tells the system that there is a change that has happened right and then it invokes the, it notifies the observers. The observers are notified with the new state value, right? You can see it passes the name value as an argument to the notify observer method, right? The notify observer method takes an argument which is the, uh, which is the attribute of the system which has changed, which is the object of the system which has changed, right? Internally, this notify ob observer method loops through all the observers, right? And it will pass the name value to the observers, right? Then there is a set price method. Similarly, it does the same thing, right? It uh, sets the price to the incoming value, uh, set change in invoke and then notify observers is again invoked by passing the price value. Okay, I'll take up the questions. Just uh, let me finish the explanation. Uh, that was the concrete subject. Now let's come to the concrete observer. Right, so my name observer, which implements the observer interface is now a observer which attaches itself to the uh, to the uh, concrete observer right 
Now, what this observer does, it is interested in the name, in observing the name object of the observer, of the subject, right? So, this is my uh, constructor of the name observer, and then it implements the update method of the observer, right? What it does, whenever a notify is invoked by the subject, the the notify of the subject invokes the update method of the observer, right? Now, the observer will see the type of change. If the type of change is a name change, right, it says that the name has been changed. Otherwise, it some print out that some other change has happened to the subject, right? Similarly, there is a price observer, right? The price observer implements the observer interface and has a price method, price uh, attribute with it, right? Now, this also implements the update method. Now, again, the notified object uh, invokes the update of this particular uh, price observer, right? And parts passes to it this object argument, right? Now, this scans whether it is an instance of float. If it is an instance of float, that means the price has changed, then only this price observer is interested. Otherwise, something else has changed to the subject, and then the price is uh, price observer is not interested. Right? Okay. Let's come to the last participant of this pattern, which is the client. Right? So what my client does, it creates an object of concrete subject, right? An object S of the concrete subject is created with two attributes, name and price, right? The name observer object is created and a price observer object is created. Then my observers are attached to the subject. So it says S dot add observer. Right, and it passes to it an object of type observer. Similarly, s dot add observer, the price observer. Right, so this is how we see that the object, the observers are attached to the subject. Now, the subject maintains a list of these observers, and whenever the observers have to be notified, it iterates through the list which it maintains. Right and invokes the update method of each of these observers, right? Although this, all this interna internal implementation of add observers is already done for you in the java.util.observable class so that you can directly use it, right? However, if it is not done, if you want, to, if you do not want to use those two uh, base a classes and the implement and the observable interface which is there in the Java, you can actually implement the observer and the observable from scratch without using the inbuilt classes as well. Right? So you need to provide implementation for the add observer. The idea is that the subject maintains an array list of observers, right? And you add observers uh, Whenever you invoke add observer, you add to that array list. Whenever you have to delete, you delete from that array list. And whenever you have to notify the observer, you iterate through that array list and invoke the update method of all the observers. Right? Then you say s dot set name. Right? So the moment the name is set, your automatically your uh, name observer will be notified. Right? Because in s dot set name we had written uh, set changed and notify observers. Right? Similarly, you say s dot set price, so the price observer will get notified. Again, s dot set price, price observer will get notified, and again the name observer gets notified of the change in the state of the observable. Right? I'll take up a few questions. Let me see how much I've clarified. 
okay so uh, there is a question when there is a change in set name and set price method invoke observers will notify whom right so this question came before i came to this slide right so now i hope you understand that uh, whom to notify right so you have added those observers to the subject right so these are the people these are the observers who are attached to them and they need to be notified right <coughs> When we are changing password, we get a command after entering new password, your password is changed successfully. Is it an observer pattern? No, that is not an observer pattern. Uh, there's a question which I don't want to take up now. I mean, that's too late for the question. Should have done in the first class. What is the difference between an interface and class? Okay, so uh, this is one question that should have come in the first class. Please go through a few books and you'll be able to find out what is the difference between an interface and a class. Okay. <coughs> I think that's it. Uh, most of it is clear. Uh, these set change and notify methods, these are very commonly used in the uh, graphical user interface classes which are inbuilt in java so whenever there is a change in the value of a table right the in the values which are to be listed in various rows of a table a table ui gets notified and it updates itself right so these kind of these kind of places are where uh, the observer pattern is most commonly used right the data model uh, is maintained using a table model object and the UI is displayed by a separate object. So whenever the table model changes, the UI is updated automatically by the notification. You, okay, there's another question. You had set change and notify methods. Where are those implemented? So those are implemented in the java.util.observable class. Right, so we saw in this case in Java, java.util.observable class is implemented. Any any class which is a concrete subject, instead of implementing an interface, it extends the observable class, right? And where the implementation for these methods is already provided. Okay, I think that's it for today. Uh, we'll wind up the session now, and uh, in the next class, uh, we'll go, we'll uh, move to the graph pattern. So that is going to be the 10th te lecture of this particular session, uh, of this particular course, and then we'll be left with one more session, and uh, we have two more topics left. The grasp patterns and the solid design principles, right? So in case I'm not able to cover all this in two remaining lectures, we will have another extra lecture. And then also I will try to arrange a tutorial uh, with a case study uh, which discusses uh, the application of various design patterns given a case study, right? And just to add, just to remind, um, uh, we have three things in line. So I will upload the list of the submissions of phase one that you have made. Uh, I'll also upload the details about quiz two. And then uh, maybe at the, uh, maybe after Diwali is what I plan is that I will upload the phase two of the quiz. Uh, of the assignment. Phase two of the assignment I plan to give after Diwali, right? Can you share the list of all the design patterns? I will do that, okay? So that would be really good. Uh, okay, there's another question. If I upload the phase two after Diwali, it will be too late. We have compris on November. 25th, yeah, okay, uh, I appreciate that. So I will 
try and upload it before Diwali, but uh, your phase two is will not be as elaborate as your phase one was. Right, so phase two is will totally be, be on design patterns, no UML modeling. For the same case study that you have chosen, you will have to apply uh, as many design patterns and explain the reasons, right? So this is broadly what I'm thinking. I'll explain it in the phase two document, but uh, there will not be much effort that would be required to be done in phase two. And that is the reason why we uh, divided the uh, assignment into two phases, because if it is all in one chunk, then it will, there are chances that it will not come ever, right? So this was the plan. So anyways, thanks for attending today's lecture. And um, I'll keep looking for more assign for the announcements that, will be there on the portal. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, if there are any queries, please feel free to write mails to me. I often try to answer as many as possible. Thank you.